This video is supported by Squarespace. Space travel seems to be going down a couple of different directions right now. We've all seen the mock-ups of the BFR and the new Glenn from Blue Origin stacked up against the Saturn V and touting how it's the biggest rocket ever made. I mean, big is right there in the BFR's name. Of course, so is fucking. Or Falcon. People get upset no matter how I do it. So that is one direction toward these big, super heavy, reusable rockets that can put big, huge satellites into space or a large number of smaller satellites into space or a large number of people. You get that sort of economy of scale with those big rockets. But satellites are getting smaller and smaller with tiny little CubeSats capable of telecommunications, imaging, and science stuff that normally would require huge payloads. So there's also a trend towards smaller rockets that are launching payloads like that. Rocket Lab's Electron rocket, for example, which I've covered in the past, has a 3D printed engine that's so small you can literally just carry it around. And their goal is to get rockets going up almost once a week with much smaller payloads and keeping the prices down that way. But earlier this year, the race of the small got a whole new leader when the Japanese space agency, JAXA, put a CubeSat into orbit using the smallest orbital rocket ever. The launch was performed on their SS-520 rocket, which is literally just a sounding rocket that they added a third stage to in order to make it reach orbit. The rocket's only 31 feet tall and less than 2 feet in diameter. It's basically a surface-to-air missile they were able to get into orbit. The ability to launch payloads into space on rockets this small opens up a whole new opportunity for people who want to enter this whole new space race. This was a huge win for JAXA. But this was nowhere near their biggest success for this year. JAXA stands for Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and it was actually a merger of three different agencies that came together in the year 2003. The Institute of Space and Astronautical Science, or ISIS, fairly unfortunate initials, was created in the 1950s at the University of Tokyo and developed rockets and satellites, launching dozens of satellites and interplanetary probes in the 70s and 80s. The National Aerospace Laboratory, or NAL, was also created in the 50s and focused on aircraft, rockets, and other aeronautical transportation systems. And the National Space Development Agency of Japan, or NASDA, was founded in 1969 and was responsible for building launch systems, developing satellites, and tracking technologies. The first chief of NASDA was actually Hideo Shima, who was the chief engineer behind Japan's first bullet train. Each of these different space agencies had racked up some impressive wins over the years, so it only made sense for them to combine into one coherent vision, which they put together and called JAXA 2025. This vision involved the building of a moon base, and then populating that moon base with robots to sort of maintain and help grow it. And this also kind of piggybacked off of George W. Bush's plan for NASA to have a moon base up by the year 2020, which as we all know has worked out perfectly. JAXA got off to a rough start when their first launch as a unified agency ended in failure on their new rocket, the H-2A. In the pre-JAXA days, ISIS actually focused on smaller solid rocket boosters, whereas NASDA worked on larger liquid-fueled boosters, or sometimes they licensed American rockets as well, but the H-2A was the first Japanese-built rocket that they had to work with. It's a two-stage rocket powered by liquid oxygen and hydrogen flanked by a duo of strap-on solid rocket boosters. The rocket actually had a string of five successes under NASDA, but this first launch under JAXA fell apart due to a hot gas leak in one of the solid rocket boosters. And this grounded JAXA's fleet for about 15 months, but since then it's worked flawlessly, and actually in 2010 they introduced a new rocket called the H-2B. They launch out of the Tanegashima Space Center on Tanegashima Island, which some say is one of the most beautiful launch sites in the world. Although Rocket Lab may have something to say about that. Now JAXA does have a manned space program, although they don't have any rockets to actually get their uh, astronauts into space. They have to rely on Russian rockets, you know, just like we do. There are seven current JAXA astronauts and four former astronauts for a grand total of seven. The first Japanese astronaut in space was Mamuro Mori, who went up on 1985 on the Space Shuttle Endeavor. He did this through NASDA back in the day. Today, JAXA astronauts regularly travel to the ISS, the most recent one left in June of this year, and while up there, they helped to maintain another of JAXA's big accomplishments, the Kibo Space Module. The Kibo Module, also known as the Japanese Experimental Module, or JEM, is the largest single module on the ISS. It includes a pressurized space for astronauts to work and live, but also an exposed facility, which they call the Terrace, that allows for science experiments in exposed space. And these experiments are handled and carried out by a state-of-the-art robotic arm also designed by JAXA. Some other major successes for JAXA include the Kaguya Moon Orbiter. Launched in 2007, the Kaguya mission, which also went by Selene, you know, just to make everything complicated, took detailed observations of the moon's gravitational field, including the first accurate reading of the field on the far side of the moon, 
and was a mission that found permanently shaded craters at the south pole of the moon that might be the best option for lunar bases in the future. Another standout project from JAXA was called the Planet C mission, also known as Etsuki, that went to Venus. Etsuki launched in May of 2010 and was supposed to enter orbit six months later, but a failed orbital injection burn sent the craft in a heliocentric orbit. In other words, instead of orbiting Venus, it orbited the sun kind of alongside Venus. So for five years, Atsuki just kind of floated around out there waiting for its path to line back up with the planet. But when it did, the engineers at JAXA science the shit out of it and did a series of orbital maneuvers to get it into a very highly elliptical orbit, which is not really what they had in mind, but by God, they made it work. Atsuki immediately produced some interesting findings when it spotted what they called a gravity wave across Venus and its clouds, a giant wave in the atmosphere that stretched from north to south poles. JAXA scientists named this phenomenon the Venusian Equatorial Jet, which is similar to the jet stream here on Earth. Also on this mission was the Icarus solar cell, which became the first solar sail to travel to another planet. And they actually did some really cool stuff with Icarus, including steering it not by using any kind of propellant, but by shifting between lighter and darker shades of material on the sail, which absorbed and reflected various amounts of the solar wind. But for me anyway, the project that really puts JAXA on the map is the Hayabusa sample return missions. Hayabusa, which is Japanese for Falcon, is a JAXA program that actually interacted with an asteroid and returned a sample of material from that asteroid to Earth. And some of the technology here is friggin' awesome. Now, if the name Hayabusa sounds familiar, it's because they actually made some headlines just a few months ago by uh, reaching orbit around the asteroid Ryugu and dropping a couple of landers on top of that. But this was not the first time that they've done this. This was Hayabusa 2. Hayabusa 1 launched in May of 2003 and went to the asteroid Itokawa. And while it was not the first probe to go to an asteroid and study it, it was the first to actually return a sample of that asteroid back to Earth. And to do this, they had to achieve another first, which is actually landing on an asteroid and then flying away. And in the process, they were going to drop a lander onto the asteroid and leave it there called Minerva. Hayabusa reached the asteroid on October 7, 2005, and here's where things started to go a little bit wrong. The first thing that happened was they lost a couple of reaction wheels, which made it more difficult to aim the probe. They had to use their thrusters in, um, in lieu of that, which made it a lot less accurate. So when they went to release Minerva, the lander, the uh, thrusters actually had pushed the spacecraft further away from the asteroid than they thought, and the lander, instead of hitting the asteroid, just kind of floated off into space. They did, however, successfully touch down on the asteroid Itogawa and were able to collect some samples basically by sort of kissing it with the collector and then flying away back to Earth. The tiny sample return capsule burned through the atmosphere over Australia on June 13, 2010 and landed in the Woomera prohibited area in the outback, just as planned. It's pretty remarkable. The sample return provided about 1,500 grains from the asteroid that contained the minerals olivine, pyroxene, plagioclase, and iron sulfide, and suggested that the asteroid was once part of a bigger asteroid that broke away. So while the first Hayabusa mission didn't go perfectly to plan, it was still a major win for JAXA and a big first for planetary exploration, so a Hayabusa 2 mission was quickly greenlighted. And where the Hayabusa 1 had one Minerva lander, Hayabusa 2 has two Minerva landers, the Minerva 2-1 and the Minerva 2-2. Yeah, and the Minerva 2-1 lander actually has two rovers on it, the Rover 1A and the Rover 1B, both of which have various thermometers and cameras on them. And Minerva 2-2 carried the Rover 2 that actually has more cameras and other instruments like accelerometers on it. And there's actually another lander on board called Mascot, which was a joint project between the German Aerospace Agency and the French Space Agency, CNES. This one features a camera, infrared spectrometer, magnetometer, and radiometer. So four landers total, all of them rovers, but these aren't like any rovers you've ever seen before. You know, when you think rover, you think like the moon rover, you think the Curiosity rover, you think wheels, you think of something to move it across the surface of something for it to rove around, right? These don't have that. In fact, they just look like metal boxes. No wheels, no legs. So how do they move around? They hop. They literally just hop across the surface. The gravity of the asteroid is so light that wheels or legs or anything like that wouldn't have any way of actually gripping onto the surface. I mean, the attraction is almost more like static electricity. So they move by actually rotating different masses inside the box and the torque that that applies is enough to make it flip into whatever direction they want it to go in. That's crazy. So yeah, if you came upon this asteroid, you would just see a bunch of boxes kind of bouncing around on it. That's, that's what it would look like. Hayabusa 2 arrived at Ryugu in June and released Minerva 2-1 and its two rovers on September 21st, just eight or so weeks ago. 
And in the process, these rovers took a series of super cool pictures, including this one that I swear to God, I want to do a science fiction movie just so I can use this as the poster. This is the coolest image. And just two weeks later, the mascot probe successfully landed. So they're three for three so far. And the Rover 2 on Minerva 2-2, that's a lot of twos, is supposed to be uh, landing on July of 2019. And the plan is for Hayabusa 2 to make three different sample collections, the last of which is the most dramatic because it's actually going to send an impactor to the surface and blow out a crater and then uh, select from some samples from inside that crater. So they sort of a subsurface collection as well. And by the way, every time they do one of these sample collections, they use these target markers that they drop down to the surface that are reflective and it lets it know exactly how far away from the surface it is. And on each one of these target markers are names of hundreds of people from the Planetary Society and JAXA's own fundraising campaigns who helped pay to fund this project. So the plan is for Hayabusa 2 to leave Ryugu in December of 2019 and return the samples to Earth in sometime in 2020, which will make the second time JAXA's been able to actually successfully return samples from an asteroid, and they're still the only agency in the world that's been able to do it. Although NASA does have a sample return probe called OSIRIS-REx, which just reached its asteroid called Bennu in the last month or so, uh, but it's not supposed to return its samples to Earth until 2023. As for what's next for JAXA, their next big project has them landing on another, much larger planetary body, the Moon. The Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM, is currently scheduled to launch in 2021, and its goal is to demonstrate precision landing on the Moon. Using software based on facial recognition technology, the SLIM Lander will attempt to pinpoint landing near the Marius Hills Hole, which is a lava tube that was found by the Kaguya orbiter. Their goal is to soft land in an area with only a 100 meter wide error range. Now, to put that into perspective, the Apollo 11 landing had a 20 kilometer wide error range. And this is an important step toward colonizing the moon because if we're ever going to get to that point, we're gonna to have to learn how to do very accurate precision landing on the moon. And we've landed lots of stuff on the moon before, but that's still not something we perfected. So between their incredibly advanced robots and AI, their rockets that are winning the race to the small and their interplanetary successes, JAXA may not be earning all the headlines in the world, but they are carving out a very important niche in space exploration. So to JAXA, I offer a well-deserved Kampai. I've got plenty of links to articles and videos about what JAXA's got going on, some of the programs they're working on down in the description below. Go check them out, learn more about it. Better yet, share it with the world. And what better way to do that than with a website, with Squarespace. Squarespace is the premium online website platform that makes it easy to create beautiful professional websites without a lifetime of graphic design experience. They've got easy to use drag and drop templates that make you look way more talented than you actually are with widgets to superpower your site and e-commerce solutions and great customer support for the noobs. Head over to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott for a free one month trial. And if you want to sign up for their services, enter Joe Scott in the coupon code and you can get 10% off the purchase of any domain or website. Just for you guys, cause they love you. Whatever it is you're passionate about, the best way to get started is to make a website about it. So make it easy on yourself. Go the simple route, go to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott and get started today. Thanks to Squarespace for supporting this video and to the great and wonderful people of my answer files on Patreon who are making a big community and doing really wonderful things. I really enjoy interacting with you guys. There are some new people that have just joined. I want to get through their names real quick. We've got Brant Waddell, Doc Mac, Pat Patrol X, CB, Meriden Ur Ermes. I swear that's the person's name. Dale A. Richards, Taylor Haynes, Patrick Chef PC Kusher, Soren Jensen, David Porter, Ken Saltzer, and Oscar Buzio. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to early uh, access to videos and behind the scenes stuff, extra footage, and just get to hang out with me, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this video too. So check that one out. And uh, if you like that one, please do subscribe because I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, that'll do it for now. Thanks you guys again for watching. Go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.